Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much, Owen, uh, for inviting me here and to the other members and representatives of the Irish Skin Foundation who have been so generous and thoughtful in inviting me to this beautiful, if rather cold and rainy city. Um, I have the great pleasure this evening of speaking to you about really what is my favorite topic and is probably one of yours, even if you don't realize it. Skin is not only the body's largest organ, but it is an amazingly important interface for humans. Throughout the history of the human lineage, all seven million years of the human lineage, skin has been our primary interface with the environment and with each other. Naked skin, such as depicted in this beautiful photograph of one of Spencer Tunick's installations, is fairly recent in our lineage's history. It's only been around for probably about the last million and a half years. But naked skin has been, in a sense, even more important as a tool of communication than hairy skin because it allows us to decorate. And also, since the evolution of functional nakedness, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, we see the evolution of a variety of different skin colors. So that we can really think about human skin, modern human skin, as being inherently naked, potentially very sweaty, coming in a range of colors, and often decorated. Really a remarkable organ. And today, I'm going to try, in a very short period of time, to give you a guided tour of a few of these aspects. I'm not going to talk about skin diseases per se, but rather the evolution of skin in health. And it, I think it will become obvious to you in the course of this lecture just how much more there is to say and how important it will be for you to come back to the subsequent lectures that are involved in the launching of this wonderful Irish Skin Foundation. Before we existed as a human lineage, our primate relatives uh, and our ancestors were very hairy creatures. And when we look, uh, at, sorry, we'll go back. And when we look at all of our relatives, virtually, uh, as I say, until about a million and a half or so years ago, all of our primate relatives are very hairy. So we have a certain challenge in trying to reconstruct the evolution of human skin because we have all of these hairy relatives that superficially don't look very much like us. And we have very few ancient humans that have skin on them. This beautifully preserved Danish bog body, and there are wonderful Irish bog bodies also. I just didn't happen to have a photograph of one. Uh, are, are some of the few examples of skin that has been preserved for more than a few hundred years, in this case by the acidic waters of a peat bog. But generally, skin is not something that archaeologists and paleontologists can study intact, because like the rest of the soft tissues of the body, it disintegrates very quickly after death. And so, for people like me, a comparative biologist, an evolutionary biologist, I must resort to the tools of comparative biology in order to answer a lot of evolutionary questions. And what we see in this, uh, in this delightful picture is really uh, our relatives. Okay, you may not feel perhaps a close uh, feeling of kinship with these, with these other relatives, but I certainly do. This is our closest living cousin, the chimpanzee, next living gorilla, the orangutan, the gibbon, and the old world monkey. This, all of this group, very, very closely related animals. And in order for us to really understand the context of the evolution of human skin, we have to know something about the skin and all these close relatives. But thank goodness, they share a lot in common. And 
One of the things that we can say probably for certain is that this shared ancestor was hairy. This common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans was hairy. And the condition that we find under the dark hair of all of these individuals is lightly pigmented skin. So even though they may have darkened faces, they actually have light skin under their hair. And so the probable ancestral condition for the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans and the earliest member of our lineage was probably quite similar to that of a chimpanzee, lightly pigmented skin covered by dark hair. And what, what's interesting, if you look at this, this little mite here uh, with his light face, this is typical of a young primate that has not yet been in the sun very much. During the course of his life, he will, uh, as he's exposed to ultraviolet radiation, develop more pigmentation on his skin so that he'll look more like his mum. But the skin underneath his dark hair will continue to be light. And so this was almost certainly the ancestral condition from which our skin first evolved. Now, if we progress quite quickly along the route of human evolution, we come to some true human ancestors. Some of you may recognize this beautiful partial skeleton from a species called Australopithecus afarensis that lived in Ethiopia about three and a half million years ago. Now, what, we don't have to go through a lot of, about this, this fascinating individual, except to say that, that she, this, this, this particular individual, is known by the moniker of Lucy. Uh, for a variety of interesting reasons. She was short, and although she was upright, she was not an energetic walker. She was ape-like in her body proportion. She had short legs, long arms, and was very, very good at climbing trees when she wasn't walking around. And so we can re reconstruct just on the basis of what we know of her physiology, that she probably would not have been building up a lot of body heat through walking around or moving around in the heat of the day. So her skin probably looked much like that of a chimpanzee. And so this was the state of our skin for several million years into our history. But things changed, and by about a million and a half years ago, we see early members of the genus Homo. The genus Homo arose about two million years ago in Africa, and this is one of the most outstandingly complete skeletons that we have from the, the western shores of Lake Turkana in Kenya. This, this incredible individual was a young male, and when we look carefully at the anatomy of his pelvis, his hips, his knees, what we see is that this was a demonstrably modern individual in terms of its lifestyle. He had relatively short arms, longer legs, and he was an energetic, walking, striding, and running biped. Very different from the Australopithecus that preceded it. And so this individual would have built up much more body heat in the course of its daily activity and Primates as a whole, all of our primate relatives, liberate most of their excess body heat through sweating from the surface of their bodies, through radiation and sweating. So it's at this point that we can see the evolution of functionally naked skin. This is something that we can, we can reconstruct on the basis of paleoecological and anatomical evidence and that was independently uh, investigated and verified using genomic evidence. So we know from several different convergent lines of evolution that functional nakedness of the human body evolved about a million and a half to 1.2 million years ago because of the importance of sweating in heat loss. And so we owe our, our 
functional nakedness to this reason. There have been many other reasons that have been mooted over the decades, but by far this is the most cogent, that we became mostly naked, retaining a few tufts of hair here and there, but we came mostly naked in order to stay cool under hot conditions and when we ourselves were building up a lot of body heat through intense exercise. Now, one of the exciting things about human skin, about naked human skin, is that there are many features of it that in a sense compensate for the lack of fur. Fur is wonderful at reducing abrasion, at preventing damage from sunlight, at preventing the ingress of pathogens. It's a great thing to have. So when you lose it, albeit for good reasons, you have to compensate. And what we see in the evolution of modern human skin are a variety of compensatory structures. Uh, the very surface of the epidermis of the skin is called the stratum corneum, and it's absolutely remarkable in modern humans because it contains so many specialized types of chemicals that help to maintain the skin's waterproof aspects and help the skin to resist disease. So the, the stratum corneum has often been depicted in this sort of bricks and mortar model that has composite functions. It's an excellent UV barrier. It's an excellent mechanical barrier against routine abrasion. It protects against loss of water. And it's selectively permeable. And it has uh, a, an extracellular matrix that, that has that it's rich in lipids and that generates a potent antiviral state. So this is an incredible, incredible interface that we have. And Significantly, many of these aspects of the stratum corneum are unique to the modern human lineage and different from what we find in the stratum corneum of chimpanzees or other higher primates. And in fact, we've been able to learn a lot more about this as we've investigated the genome of our closest relative, chimpanzees. And when people were investigating this, they expected to find that chimpanzees were going to be massively different in things like their brains and muscles. They are, but they're massively different from us also in their skin. And human skin shows tremendously rapid evolution of the, this, what, what's called here the epidermal differentiation complex, basically everything that makes the stratum corneum and other parts of the epidermis modern. And so here we have this, this wonderful skin barrier, absolutely gorgeous, the stratum corneum, as I've described earlier. And what is so interesting about this is that you have this, this quite impervious, quite remarkably resistant barrier that is continually renewing itself and that's extremely sensitive to touch. The, uh, the dermis and the epidermis are richly supplied with nerve endings. And so we can differentiate a tremendous number of different types of stimuli on the surface of our skin. So we have naked skin that's resistant to all sorts of, of external environmental attack, and it replenishes itself and maintains continuous sensitivity. Of course, we lost a few things when we lost our hair. Our close relatives, and even our distant relatives, if you have a dog or a cat, you know that one of the things that they can do with their hair when they're feeling anxious or fearful or angry is to raise their hackles. What do we do? I mean, we can still erect the little hairs on our bodies, but it doesn't look like much. In fact, it's pretty pathetic, right? Okay. So how did we compensate for not having this ability to pylo-erect or raise the hairs on our body? We don't know exactly how we did this, but I would venture that part of the package was that we became much more fixated on facial expression and our intentions became much more clearly visible on our faces as our muscles of facial expression became more uh, densely uh, differentiated and, uh, and uh, 
more finely controlled. And of course, once we evolved functional nakedness, we had this naked canvas of skin. And I don't think it took very long for us to start decorating it in various ways. Again, it is very hard to reconstruct exactly when we started to do lavish things with skin decoration. I mean, these are all modern people doing very modern things with body paint, cosmetics, uh, branding, and tattoos. But we know that humans have been using pigments, such as this piece of red ochre found in South Africa that is dated to over 70,000 years ago. This piece of red ochre was used for, for decoration, possibly of cave walls or rock shelter walls, possibly of bodies. But there were many pieces of this kind of red ochre found at this site and other pieces of body decoration. Humans have been decorating themselves for a long time. It's just we don't find a lot of evidence for it because it disintegrates. The oldest tattoos, some of you may recognize this as the so-called Iceman, uh, who was retrieved from a glacier, a melting glacier, at the Austrian-Italian border several years ago. The Iceman, Ötzi, as he is called, has numerous tattoos on his body. Uh, these probably weren't decorative because they were in, in places where mostly he couldn't see them. But they might have been therapeutic. They might have been uh, part of, of uh, ritual application for some reason that we don't know. But what is significant is that people had the technology to create re very regular lines of durable tattoos that this man had for apparently much of his adult life. So we've been uh, engaging in decoration for a very long time. And of course, these days, uh, the fact that celebrities decorate themselves, sometimes very lavishly, and they use particular kinds of cosmetic products or whatever, adds to the fact that we tend to mimic them. So we, we have uh, whole cultures of elaborate imagery that, uh, that lead to the propagation of body decoration styles. I specialize in the study of skin color, skin pigmentation, and one of the most conspicuous things that not just I, but many people before me have noted is that skin is variable in its color, and the variation has a geographic pattern. With the darkest pigmentation found in equatorial regions, and the lightest pigmentation found closer to the poles in both hemispheres. Herodotus, Hippocrates, Aristotle, and many other uh, Greek thinkers and thinkers of the ancient world recognized that skin color was appeared to be related to some aspect of the sun, and that the darkest people in the world were found in the places with the most intense sun. And in fact, uh, some African people were described by ancient Greeks as having been burnt by the sun. We now know that this burning uh, was due to intense ultraviolet radiation that is part of normal sunshine in much of the world. I'm saying that guardedly because I'm not trying to cast aspersions over your beautiful Irish skies, but compared to the rest of the world, you don't get much ultraviolet radiation here. But I want you to pay close attention to this map because it shows that, that we have very strong ultraviolet radiation here at the equator, but the pattern isn't just strictly in sort of latitudinal strips. Uh, the driest areas of the world, like here in northeastern Africa, here in the Atacama Desert of 
Chile and Peru, uh, we have very, very high levels of ultraviolet radiation. In areas that have more cloud cover, such as here in Amazonia, even though we're right on the equator, the cloud absorbs ultraviolet radiation and so less falls to Earth. So we have a basic geographic pattern uh, that grades from high levels near the equator to much lower levels near the poles, but there are little geographic exceptions that actually prove to be quite important. And for those of you who like numbers, um, in our studies, we have actually looked at the relationship between skin pigmentation and ultraviolet radiation levels. And what we've been able to find is that there's a very high correlation between these two entities. And this correlation is undoubtedly the product of a cause and effect relationship. It is not simply a, 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 a simple correlation. And 86% of the total variation that we see in skin color worldwide can be accounted for by strength of ultraviolet radiation. Now, those of you who have paid attention to your dermatologist know that ultraviolet radiation can cause skin cancer because it causes damage to DNA in skin cells. It can do this in a variety of ways. But I, as an evolutionary biologist and others, realize that most skin cancers afflict people when they're past reproductive age. Although malignant melanoma does afflict younger people. It afflicts such a small percentage of people, and probably in our past, it afflicted so many fewer people that it wouldn't have really been a major force in evolution. One of the big problems when we think about a force in evolution, it must affect individuals during their reproductive lives in order to affect their reproductive success. And so the fact that DNA damage causes skin cancer and that most skin cancers afflict people in their 50s and 60s doesn't mean anything with respect to evolution. And this what really got me going many years ago in seeking an explanation for why skin pigmentation evolved the conspicuous pattern that it has. If skin pigmentation is protecting us from something dangerous in the sun, what it is that? And what we realized was that ultraviolet radiation, among the many bad things that it does, is that it has a distinct effect on the metabolism of an important B vitamin. Many of you may be familiar with the name folate or folic acid, as it is called in its uh, a synthetic form. Folate is an important B vitamin that we get from citrus fruits and green vegetables and whole grains. We have to consume it. Our bodies don't make it. And folate turns out to be one of these massively important vitamins that has become more important in the public eye in the last 20 years because it is implicated in so many important biological functions one of the major ones being cell division because folate provides some of the necessary chemical building blocks for making DNA and for repairing and regulating DNA as well. And what really got me interested in, uh, in folate as, as a possible, um, as possibly related to the evolution of skin pigmentation is the fact that studies in the 1970s showed that folate was sensitive to ultraviolet radiation, that it could actually be broken down in laboratory experiments and in dermatology patients. And there appeared to be a strong relationship between intense ultraviolet radiation exposure and folate levels. Well, when I got to think about this, I realized that this was probably an important causal mechanism for the evolution of skin pigmentation. I wasn't the first person to think about this, but I was a person who was in the right place at the right time with more data. 
And I think that's very fortunate. Because I happened to be sitting at the same time that I was sort of finding out about uh, the significance of folate in relation to ultraviolet radiation. I was finding out about the importance of folate in cell reproduction and in normal development. Many of you now may be aware of the importance of folate because you've been told to take folate supplements if you're planning on having an infant. And here, this is, this is a beautiful picture of you at age 21 days as a tiny embryo. Here, as your primordial nervous system is being formed, the neural tube. This process turns out to be incredibly important to forming the, the, the adult nervous system. And without a properly formed neural tube, basically you don't have a viable embryo. And this process requires prodigious and precisely timed cell division that requires lots of folate. If a mother is deficient in folate at this critical time, a neural tube defect can result and can often be very serious and result in spontaneous abortion, or a less serious one can result in one of the more common forms of spina bifida and other neural tube defects. In any case, these are serious. They affect reproductive success. And so I was very excited when I realized that we had in ultraviolet radiation a mechanism here in the destruction of folate and in the multiple effects of ultraviolet radiation on folate metabolism that actually was a smoking gun, as it were, in the evolution of skin pigmentation. This is why dark protective pigmentation evolved. Melanin is a natural sunscreen and acts in many respects like good sunscreening sunglasses. Melanin is formed uh, from building blocks of the amino acid tyrosine through a series of, of complicated steps. And the most important, uh, I, I don't want to say perhaps that's the wrong word with an Irish audience, because um, melanin comes in two major forms. Eumelanin is extremely important as a protective agent against ultraviolet radiation and many other uh, dangerous uh, uh, forms of ionizing radiation. Pheomelanin, which is formed by a slightly different process, turns out to be remarkably important in the history of Ireland and other parts of Northern Europe for reasons that will become apparent in a few minutes. But eumelanin is, is important because it's this long complex polymer, incredibly interesting molecule, that has the ability to absorb energy, solar energy, ultraviolet radiation energy, and slightly deform its structure as it absorbs the energy. Thereby, it, it is able to neutralize a tremendous amount of ultraviolet radiation that falls upon skin that has eumelanin in it. Eumelanin also has the remarkable property of being able to act as sort of a chemical sponge. It can, it can uh, neutralize the effect of reactive oxygen species free radicals that are formed when ultraviolet radiation impinges on the skin. So it's really a, an amazing molecule, and it's used by all sorts of organisms, not only primates and mammals, but many, many other animals and organisms in the world. So I, I could go on poetically for a long time, but suffice it to say, uh, here's my colleague who works with us in, in East Turkana uh, on our fossil expeditions. He has a superb amount of eumelanin in his skin. When he's outside with us, he produces a lot more eumelanin. Ultraviolet radiation uh, catalyzes, stimulates the formation of eumelanin in his melanin-producing cells or melanocytes. Under the same intense sun, I produce a feeble amount of eumelanin. I still produce some, but I basically burn to a crisp very, very quickly, whereas he can withstand a much, much higher level of ultraviolet radiation. 
Now, if we look at our hairy timeline of human evolution, we can just sort of recap where we, where we came from. Here we are uh, back at the common ancestor of, of modern of humans and chimpanzees around six to seven million years ago. Our skin was, was pale and covered with dark hair, and then by about 1.5 or 1.2 million years ago, we have evolved mostly hairless skin on our bodies and have darkly pigmented skin. And for individuals who who's stayed in Africa throughout, including early members of Homo sapiens, our genus Homo evolved continually in Africa, Homo sapiens evolved first in Africa around 200,000 years ago, and the Homo sapiens who have remained in Africa are darkly pigmented. And we'll now talk about the few populations who left. But before that, let's just look at what ultraviolet radiation does when it falls on the surface of the Earth. Uh, in this very simple, uh, animation, we have ultraviolet radiation. Let's say this is the vernal equinox in, uh, and here we are in Africa and Afro-Arabia. So roughly at the equator, the vernal equinox, equal days, equal nights, ultraviolet radiation, very energetic UVC, is completely absorbed by atmospheric oxygen and ozone. It's very damaging. It comes to Earth through the ozone holes only, and it doesn't do very much damage there, thank goodness. Ultraviolet B radiation, which is, uh, is, is, is medium length ultraviolet radiation, is filtered mostly by the atmosphere. But here at the equator, at the equinox, we have a goodly amount that falls to Earth. Ultraviolet A, the longest wavelength species, falls in plentiful amounts on the Earth's surface along with visible light. So we have this differential uh, filtering oops, of the of ultraviolet radiation by the atmosphere. So this is important to remember because this is basically the state under which we lived as a lineage for 6.8 million years. And so as I mentioned, we have in the early years of Homo sapiens, we have tremendous amounts of, of evolution going on within Africa. Homo sapiens first appeared around 200,000 years ago. We have excellent fossil evidence to this effect. And during the first 130,000 years of our history, we were undergoing complex radiations throughout the continent of Africa, leading to tremendous artistic, technological, and linguistic diversification that archaeologists have lavishly documented. Then for reasons that we still don't completely understand, about 70,000 years ago, a few small populations began to leave Africa via the Afro-Arabian land bridge. And they stirred around here for a short period of time before beginning journeys coastally along Southern Asia and into Southeast Asia and Australia. Uh, beginning around 70,000 years ago and actually getting to Australia possibly as early as 62 or 63,000 years ago. And then later migrations into the hinterland of Eurasia, into Central Asia and Western Europe about 50,000 years ago, in Eastern Asia 40,000 years ago, Northeastern Asia, and thence considerably later, 20,000 years ago into the Bering Strait and eventually into the New World. The population of the New World probably occurred at least in two waves, but both populations came from North Central Asia. One wave progressed along the coast and made it very, very quickly into South America. Another wave came into the hinterland of the, of the Bering Strait and into uh, the central part of North America. So, so basically, after, you know, we have the story of this species with 
a loose foot. We traveled quickly. We had a lot of technology. We were incredibly technologically competent and sophisticated by this point, although significantly, we did not have sewn clothing or the ability to make structures. So our skin, our naked skin, was the primary interface between ourselves and the environment. So as we, as we ventured into these new places, many of them much colder than our African homeland and with much less UV, we didn't have a lot of cultural buffering to protect us. So let's remind ourselves of what, what UV regimes our ancestors were moving into. They were moving into some fairly uh, low UV environments. Here, look at this very large area of northern Eurasia and North America that have extremely low ultraviolet radiation levels extremely low UVB levels, as I'll soon demonstrate to you. So some, uh, some of our species, many, many people remain in Africa, and significantly within Africa, many people evolve different shades of skin pigmentation. It's completely wrong to think about everyone in Africa being uniformly dark, because they're not. And many people who come from these areas of Western coastal Africa, as well as the uh, the very southern part of Africa, are moderately pigmented. They are not darkly pigmented. So we have a lot of, of, of microevolution occurring as humans specialize and adapt to their environments. So let's think about ultraviolet radiation and let's think about the winter solstice blessedly just passed in, uh, in December, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. The situation for UVC is the same. It's completely absorbed by the atmosphere, no problem. UVB, however, is also completely absorbed and misses the land surface entirely. So in the winter months, UVB is completely absorbed by the atmosphere. UVA, however, still makes it down to the Earth along with visible light. Now, I'm dwelling on this because UVB, although mostly a, a malign entity, does something very important for us. It catalyzes the, the production of vitamin D in the skin. But before you get too excited about UVB, I want to show you how little UVB you get in Ireland. Here we are, June average, the height of summer, the, the solstice. Here we have levels of UVB. Uh, well, they aren't as bad as Iceland, but they're not great, OK? So the, these are low levels. Now, there is enough UVB in summer sunlight on a sunny day for vitamin D to be produced in skin, in lightly pigmented skin. But there aren't that many days, there are basically only two to three months maximum that there is enough UVB available. And as you know, not every day in summer is sunny. So there, there can be really quite a, a inimical situation with respect to vitamin D production. On a bad day in June, the situation here in Ireland is the same as a good day in December. In other words, not very good at all. And these are the conditions under which we see the evolution of a different type of skin pigmentation, not protective against high ultraviolet radiation, but permissive of ultraviolet radiation absorption. And as I said, the one good thing that ultraviolet radiation does, and specifically ultraviolet B radiation, is it begins the process of making vitamin D in the skin. And that is incredibly important. These two guys, if they're standing outside, they happen to be in an equatorial environment. On a sunny day at the equator, these two men who are in every way equal, except in their skin 
pigmentation, even down their sunglasses, they're pretty, they're pretty much the same in age, height, everything. Um, the man on the left will make vitamin D in his skin at a rate five to six times faster than the man on the right. Now, if the man on the right stands outside long enough, he will make plenty of vitamin D to satisfy his physiological needs. And during most of human evolution, people were outside all the time. So dark skin at the equator was a superb adaptation, protective against intense ultraviolet radiation, but still allowing enough ultraviolet B in to make adequate amounts of vitamin D to maintain health. If an individual doesn't receive enough vitamin D, there are a series of very serious consequences. People became aware of these decades ago in Europe uh, when rickets became a feature of many urban environments, including in Dublin. Children with rickets were considered a product of the Industrial Revolution, but more realistically and generally, they were simply a product of vitamin D deficiency. These children were not getting enough ultraviolet radiation to begin the process of making vitamin D in the skin. Vitamin D, one of its main uh, functions, is the absorption of calcium from the gut. And so when you eat calcium in your diet, its absorption is made possible by vitamin D that attaches to receptors in the gut lining. And if you don't have vitamin D, calcium cannot be absorbed. And the long bones become uh, weakened, they can become bowed under the body weight, and this is the conspicuous picture of nutritional rickets, as it was classically described. In the most serious cases, actually in, in young women, uh, the female pelvis can be badly deformed to the extent that it precludes normal childbirth. So this is a very serious sort of talk about the sword of natural selection falling. This is a good example of it. But we now know that, that vitamin D not only is important in calcium and phosphorus uptake, but perhaps even more important in the control and maintenance of the immune system. Much of the uh, innate and adaptive immune system is regulated by vitamin D. And under conditions of chronic vitamin D deficiency, the immune system suffers and suffers badly. We also know that vitamin D is necessary for the control of cell growth and proliferation. And because of these two functions, we now are associating vitamin D deficiency with increased prevalence of many infectious diseases, some autoimmune diseases, and several types of cancer. There are now being undertaken many important prospective epidemiological studies that will shed light and provide much more empirical evidence in the next five years about these. But all I can say for now is watch this space. Your doctor is going to be talking to you a lot more about vitamin D in the future. So we can think in an evolutionary sense about humans, modern humans, these few populations dispersing to low UVB regions. They, have, they experience with their dark skin slowed vitamin D production, excess mortality due to vitamin D deficiency, and there is natural selection pressure for less melanin pigmentation. And so my graduate student here is an excellent example of an individual of European descent who has depigmented skin. It's really appropriate to think about European and East Asian skin as being depigmented uh, because we have lost much of our uh, eumelanin pigmentation uh, and lost much of our tanning ability. And we now know as the result of some really superb genetic and genomic studies in the last 15 years that this 
depigmented appearance is due to, to a few different types and locations of genetic mutations. There has been one particularly important one that has been identified in the depigmentation of Europeans, the SLC24A5 uh, locus, a particular uh, form of this gene has uh, evolved to be present at nearly 100% uh, uh, penetrance uh, at the level of fixation in Western Europeans. And it appears to be the primary gene responsible for depigmented European skin. But what we also see are some really interesting loss of function mutations in the so-called master pigmentation gene, the MC1R or melanocortin 1 receptor locus. And those interesting MC1R polymorphisms are what contribute to so many of the characteristic uh, beautiful redheads and uh, fair-skinned individuals that we find in, uh, in this country and in much of Northern Europe. This, uh, this is due to a lot of pheomelanin. I told you I would tell you a little bit more about pheomelanin. It's the yellow-red type of melanin that's actually present in all human skin, but it's most visible in individuals who have lost most eumelanin as a result of, of the evolution of depigmentation, as I've just uh, laid out. Pheomelanin is a fascinating molecule. It also has the ability to absorb ultraviolet radiation. But unfortunately, instead of, of neutralizing reactive oxygen species, when ultraviolet radiation impinges on pheomelanin, it produces reactive oxygen species that in turn can set in train a series of cancer-causing chemical reactions in the body, making it more likely that an individual will have skin cancer. And so this type of melanin, which is found conspicuously in the freckles of many people that have had some sun exposure and is also present uh, beautifully in, uh, in the red hair oops, of, this, uh, of this young lad, uh, this type of melanin is actually sad to say beautiful but not very good for you. And, uh, and much of the higher prevalence of skin cancer, including uh, the higher prevalence of melanoma in Ireland, Scotland, Northern England, and other parts of Northern Europe, is due to uh, a high prevalence or a, a higher percentage of pheomelanin in the skin. And of course, as I say, we pay the price of this. We, uh, People who don't have much eumelanin in the skin are much more susceptible to sunburns. And it's, it's salutary to reflect on the fact that humans haven't been engaging in this kind of activity for very long. Our ancestors did not go on holiday. They stayed at home. Even until about 100 or even 50 years ago, people didn't travel much. You can think about people in Dublin or rural Ireland. They, they stayed at home, they stayed on farms, they didn't go to Ibiza. Now they do. And so they're subject to intense changes of, of solar regime and very strong ultraviolet radiation that their skin is very poorly prepared for. And as a result, we have a dramatic increase in all skin cancers, including the most serious melanoma. From an evolutionary perspective, the most fascinating thing about the, about the evolution of depigmentation is that it happened more than once. We have in Eastern Asians an equivalent amount of loss of pigmentation, but for a completely different set of genetic reasons. And this is something that evolutionary biologists love to see. When there is such strong, intense natural selection pressure on a system, 
Either the organisms change as a result of having mutations that will confer a beneficial effect, or the organisms become extinct. And happily for humans and the people studying human evolution, they changed. They had mutations. Both of these lineages, Europeans and East Asians, had mutations that allowed them to evolve depigmented skin. And what's really fun is that we've been able, we being the royal we, my colleague in Barcelona, Carlos Laloesa Fox, was able several years ago to actually look at the a DNA sequence in the nuclear DNA of a Neanderthal. He looked at the ancient DNA, and he was able to reconstruct the activity of the main pigmentation locus, the MC1R locus, and recognized that in Neanderthals, like in modern Western Europeans, there were interesting MC1R polymorphisms that would have produced lightly pigmented skin, and at least red hair in some individuals. So we have depigmentation evolving not once, not twice, but actually three times in the history of the human lineage. This, it's, it's important to remember that Neanderthals are not dead close to us. Uh, they, we last shared a common ancestor about 500,000 years ago, and although there was a small amount of interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals, it wasn't significant. And so the fact that they had depigmented skin, they evolved it for the very, very same reason, is incredibly interesting from an evolutionary perspective. So we can look at the hairy timeline and see one, two, three instances of, of the evolution of depigmentation. And now we can almost certainly make arguments that dark pigmentation evolved not just once, but multiple times as well. We know now that we are following uh, the human genome and the details of the human genome in populations in Australia and southern India, that uh, these lineages of, of modern humans have very darkly pigmented skin, but the sequence of their pigmentation genes is different from that in Africans. And so we have a lot of preliminary evidence for repigmentation, the evolution of darkly pigmented skin more than once as humans reinvaded very, very sunny, intensely UV-rich areas during later parts of human evolution. And there are many genes. There aren't just a few genes that contribute to normal pigmentation. This is just a, a, a truncated list of many of the genes that have been implicated in both uh, strong selection for dark pigmentation and depigmentation. And what's interesting is that different genes have been more important in certain populations. Natural selection works on the appearance of the individual and on reproductive success. It doesn't care about what the genes are named as long as the, the phenotype, the product that is exposed to evolution looks right and acts right. So we can really think about skin pigmentation as a compromise. We see darkly pigmented individuals closer to the equator, more lightly pigmented closer to the poles, highly tannable individuals with moderate sort of intermediate skin tones that can gain a lot of pigmentation and lose pigmentation. Uh, and we can really think about these, these two gradients uh, or clines, photoprotection emphasized closer to the equator, and photosynthesis of DNA, of, of vitamin D rather, closer to the poles. And the fact that similar skin colors have evolved uh, multiple times under similar environmental circumstances is not just interesting in terms of, of evolutionary biology. It has a lot of importance for us. Because when we think about how races were described in 
early days of anthropology and human biology, we realized that skin colors were used as markers for distinct, genetically distinct groups of individuals. Now that we know that skin colors, the same colors, have evolved multiple times under similar environmental circumstances, we know that skin color itself is a very poor marker of any unique genetic ancestry. It tells us a lot about where individuals evolved with respect to their solar regime. It tells us not one iota about where they were in terms of genetic distance from one individual to another. They do not indicate race. So I like to think about skin as being one of the best uh, ways in order to teach evolution. In the United States, I worry about people not understanding evolution and not having a so-called belief in evolution. Evolution is a fact, and it's important that we study it, that we teach it effectively, and skin pigmentation is one of the most effective ways in which we can teach, skin, uh, teach evolution. And I love it because we carry it around with us. We can all use skin pigmentation as a teaching tool for evolutionary studies because we carry it around as our own portable teaching device. So, so use it lavishly in your families, with your friends, on Facebook. It's, it's fun to talk about, and it's a great and useful thing to teach. And, of course, humans have continued in the last 500 or so years to have a very loose foot. When we look at just some of the, the voluntary migrations that have occurred in the last few hundred years, we see that people have moved from, you know, from areas of very low UV, such as Ireland and England, to areas of very high UV. They've moved from areas of very high UV, such as in, in southern India, to uh, low UV here in Ireland and, and England and elsewhere, and, and all sorts of in-between. Basically, people have gotten all mixed up. I mean, this is what makes humanity so interesting and beautiful, is that we're so highly mobile. We now have multiculturalism virtually worldwide. But this has come at a certain cost, because now more of us are living in places to which our skin is poorly adapted, or we're vacationing in places where our skin is simply out of its element. And quite apart from the voluntary migrations that people have undertaken in the last 500 years, there have been large numbers of involuntary migrations. The largest that has affected my, uh, my country, my parents' country, uh, is the transatlantic slave trade that resulted over the course of more than 350 years in the transport of nearly 14 million central equatorial Africans to the Caribbean and thence to North America or directly to South America, a much smaller number to Europe. So we have many individuals here, darkly pigmented, who have found themselves in areas quite, uh, quite different uh, in terms of solar regime from those in which their ancestors lived. And so when we look in modern New York City today or in modern Dublin, we have an enormous range of skin pigmentations and ancestries to behold. This is what creates the wonderful atmospheres of our, of our modern cities. But each one of these people has a different level of risk for vitamin D deficiency. Darkly pigmented people, especially individuals living in northerly cities like Dublin, Glasgow, are at very, very high risk of developing vitamin D deficiency because their natural uh, eumelanin-rich skin has such a wonderful complement of natural sunscreen in it that it can effectively block all ambient ultraviolet radiation, ultraviolet B radiation during the year. 
But of course, don't be too smug if you have depigmented or lightly pigmented skin because you live in a city. And people in, in Ireland are increasingly urbanized. They're living in crowded, not perhaps as polluted cities as this, but uh, many of us are working in indoor environments all the time. And when we're, uh, when we're working indoors and when we're out of doors, we're wearing clothing that occludes uh, sun, uh, sunlight from getting to the skin and effectively prevents any ultraviolet radiation from reaching our skin. Also, Dermatologists and physicians have been very good, especially in the last 30 years, at encouraging people with light skin to use sunscreen to protect against uh, too much ultraviolet radiation and skin damage, a very important message. But the collective effect of living in cities, working indoors, wearing clothing, often very strongly concealing clothing, and wearing sunscreen is that we have basically eliminated the possibility of making vitamin D in our skin most of the time. So even under your few precious summer sunny days in Dublin, many of you are going to be out of luck in the vitamin D stakes. Here, uh, I've sort of mapped, actually, my husband, who is the, the mapper of the two of us in our collective research, uh, George Chaplin, has created this beautiful map to show that, that here we have densely populated areas in Northern Europe that are really in a uh, UV unsafe zone for at least a few months of the year, actually several months of the year, uh, this area of far Northern Eurasia and Northern uh, North America uh, is, is free of UVB. There is not any possibility of making sufficient amounts of vitamin D in the skin. And people living here have to get vitamin D from some other source, either by eating vitamin D-rich foods like oily fish, sardines, mackerel. Uh, it used to be uh, cod liver, but the cod are nearly gone, so find something else or take some vitamin D supplements, but get vitamin D. This is a serious issue. And interestingly, in evolutionary time, people in ancient times, in order to live in these vitamin D unsafe zones, had to eat vitamin D-rich foods in order to stay there and stay healthy throughout the year. So we find cultures that are rich in, uh, in oily, uh, oily fish, marine mammals, and other hooved mammals that are rich in vitamin D. Basically, people have to eat vitamin D up here or they get sick and die. And today, the global disease burden caused by low ultraviolet radiation, low UVB, and vitamin D deficiency is much greater than the disease burden actually caused by skin cancers and high levels of ultraviolet radiation. I want to close by talking a little bit more about the visual aspects of skin. I know that you may not consider yourself to be like this, but you are, because as a higher primate, you're, like them, very visually oriented. You're intensely imitative and status conscious and very suggestible. And these, these attributes have been with us for far longer in our lineage than, than just the history of our own uh, human lineage, the last seven million years. These attributes are part of being a primate and have been with us at least for the last 35 million years. And I bring this up in the context of modifications of skin color, because we know that in the last 30 years, especially, there have been really interesting trends in people electively changing their skin color. In Europe and in many agricultural societies throughout Asia uh, and Western Europe, uh, for the longest time, pale skin, the epitome of depigmented skin, was prized and considered to be high status. 
Women, especially who showed no sign of sun damage on their skin, were considered excellent marriage prospects because they didn't have the signs of toil written on their faces and hands. They had no visible signs of sun exposure. The porcelain complexion, the, the virginal complexion, as it was written about. But things changed, and things changed quite dramatically in the early 20th century in Europe and then in the Americas as sunlight began to be associated with good health and not necessarily just brute toil in the fields but actually glamour. Fast forward to a very different looking woman in the early 1960s, who not only is sporting a tan without embarrassment, but she's also sporting a very skimpy outfit that allows her to get a tan. During uh, the era of Brigitte Bardot and similar ingenues, we have individuals who flaunted, flaunted their bodies and who flouted social conventions uh, by you know, openly you know, announcing that they could expose themselves and that they could get a tan. And they were photographed and the images traveled worldwide in fashion magazines and newspapers. Sun tanning became a, a, a hit a success overnight. It was something that women could do to feel good, to look good to others, to have the illusion of high status, something that people would, would praise. Oh, you look so healthy, like you've just been on vacation. And it was cheap. So sun tanning became massively popular. Uh, and of course, now in Ireland and elsewhere were reaping the sorry toll of skin cancer as the result of incautious sun exposure, such as we see here. And the, the beautiful tans lead to not so beautiful skin cancer. And I won't show you any ghastly pictures. You can get those from Patrick. Uh, on the other side of the, of the ledger, we have individuals with darkly pigmented or moderately pigmented skin who, for a variety of cogent social reasons, want to be lighter. For them, having dark skin is a liability. It marks them as having lower qualities of various kinds, diminished marriage prospects, considered not as smart, not as potentially successful. And so many women, in Africa, in the Caribbean, including many women who have resettled from these regions into Europe, uh, resort to using skin lightening or bleaching agents in order to lighten their skin. And they're promoted, of course, by the idea, by, by advertisements such as this that show this seemingly miraculous transformation from this somewhat sedate looking to this elated, uh, more lightly skinned woman on the right a very, very sad and invidious comparison because many of these skin bleaching agents damage the skin permanently. And if you think it's just women who are susceptible to such suggestion, think again. In India, where skin lightening preparations are a multi-billion rupee uh, affair, uh, men now constitute one of the major markets, and skin lightening agents are considered indispensable to young men who want to improve their prospects at a job interview or an interview with their future mother-in-law. And we see skin lightening being promoted in lots of contexts in the United States. African Americans who were the descendants of African slaves were encouraged for decades to, to lighten their skin, to be more sexually attractive, and to be considered more socially acceptable. This is really a lamentable state of affairs. We can now recognize the problem but we now need to attend to it by recognizing just how easily and readily manipulated we are and to what ends. As I said, humans are visual, imitative, and suggestible, just like this little monkey 
in response to the, the man sticking out his tongue. We are very good at imitating one another. We imitate especially those who we consider to have high status, uh, who are better or a station that we aspire to. We must always think about how suggestible we are. Skin is truly a remarkable organ. It has traveled with us. It has been our organ of protection, our major organ of communication, essential for touch, essential for announcing our intentions through body art and cosmetics, really an essential interface. But because we are so visual, we tend to not just assess appearance, assess age, assess color, but we make judgments about individuals based on these assessments. Now that we are aware of our ability to make such judgments, we have to always be cautious about placing them. And with that, I would like to close and thank you very much for your attention. Please enjoy your skin and reflect on its evolutionary history and its rich past every day. Thank you.